Good afternoon, everybody. You are super welcome to this, the first in a kind of trial series of um, possibly rolling discussions that we're planning on having um, with the Blockchain Ireland Startups Working Group. It's a topic that came up just last week with the um, emerging popularity and focus of on uh, NFTs or non-fungible tokens, a type of crypto asset which can be forged on DLT and blockchain systems. Um, I'm really delighted that three members of our startups group, uh, Kevin O'Malley, uh, Brian Elders and Paula Kilgariff, who are um, uh, have long-standing careers. Uh, the two guys, I would say, are blockchain industry players, and they will tell you a little bit about their careers and uh, how they think of NFTs. And Paula Kilgarf is uh, fairly recently returned from Asia, from China, where she was working largely in uh, retail and in the technology sector. And she has an immense amount of experience with um, fashion, popular culture, and the emerging and merging, I guess, converging field of retail technology and e-commerce. So I'm really excited to be able to introduce this uh, very novel uh, uh, proposal for ourselves. Um, and I will start with our first guest, Kevin. Kevin, do you want to give us a quick intro to your career to date? And then maybe tell us what's an NFT? Sure. Uh, thanks, Fiona. And um, I suppose, um, first off, uh, it, you know, this is all down to Fiona. So thank you very much for actually pulling these together uh, and no pressure on us at all to actually try and deliver something on a weekly basis. But I'm sure we're about to do it. Um, my background, I'm, uh, I'm corporate finance and have been for um, a number of years, got into blockchain and DLT um, in around 2012, 2013 um, with my business partner. And we um, actually set up then the Akash Innovation Hub um, in, in late 2017 uh, to focus on, on startup projects in Ireland and the UK that were looking at actually using blockchain technology, DLT. Um, and essentially, we started talking to people who had had the tech but didn't know how to commercialize it and then we had other uh fantastic founders that actually came to us that had great ideas but didn't know how to use the tech so it's been kind of um across the board uh various experiences over the last four years and in that in that space of time we've had some some projects take off fantastically well and we've had had some that haven't you know, but obviously in the failures that we've had, uh, they've, you know, just made the successes even stronger and sweeter. So, um, and uh, we ex expanded to London um, in late 2019, um, just in time for COVID. So uh, that's kind of on, on hold at the moment, but we still have the office based in London. Oh, startup journey, 100% there. Startup <laughs> journey, journey, essentially, Fiona, we were, a startup working with startups, you know, so, you know, absolutely perfect. So uh, just going back to your initial question, what's an NFT? So um, a non-fungible token. So this is always the interesting one. Fungible items, you know, they can be substituted exchange for similar items. If you think of a US dollar, it can be exchanged for one US dollar and you have the exact same thing, exact same with Bitcoin. Non-fungible is, somebody was saying to me recently, it's a super unique asset, super unique. I'm not entirely sure what super unique is, but, um, and it basically allows you to track ownership on that actual, you know, blockchain or DLT technology. Um, and I suppose, I was going to touch on Fiona, the inception of it, how it all started and so on, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, the initial start was, you know, again, it was sometime back in, in 2012 with the idea 
of colored satoshis my first experience with them uh was around 2017 when crypto kitties came on uh and basically brought the ethereum platform to an almost standstill uh which was you know that was it it, it was a very interesting time sorry I, I think it was 2017 18 time <laughs> very frustrating time because you know you were starting off from you know the actual market was changing from you know quite a bear market to sorry it was a bull market going into a bear and then all of a sudden you had you know the platform completely standing still um the i think the most expensive crypto kitty that was sold was uh was about one hundred and forty four thousand dollars, and back in 2018 that was just crazy money um you know obviously that's been you know completely usurped over the last couple of months um you know i i think the the actual people's project was what um gosh i think it was about 70 million dollars so it's you know it's getting absolutely crazy yeah it's, yeah it's, and it, i think it that one single sale with, I mean, there was, without getting into the whole details of it, there was a lot of preparation in advance of that. And, you know, it there was, yeah. The yeah, heart. there was a lot of market build up. And it was um, verified by Christie's, the, the fashion house. Yeah. 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 Oh. So um, just, I can come back to you on this, but maybe think about this, Kevin. I'm going to I'm going to go to to Brian next but think about this NFTs and they're super unique how do you think they represent value in this super unique way is 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 that the is that the question we should be asking about NFTs in and this concept of super uniqueness is it how they do it do they bring something new to the table um and, and when we're talking about crypto assets it's kind of opening pandora's box really isn't it because you know, you've got a lot of questions over ownership and rights. And, you know, that's obviously quite an important factor. Um, there's a lot of misconception at the moment in terms of what you actually own. Um, you know, uh, look at digital art, you know, that's, you, you know, that, that, and this is only something we were talking about over the last few days. <laughs> in terms of if you adjust one pixel of one JPEG or anything like that, all of a sudden that's changed. So what you owned with a slight little change is completely different and it's not yours. Yeah, I, but that, you know, that regardless of blockchain, um, that what, what constitutes digital art is, 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 is a fomented kind of question, I think, in the mm. context of contemporary art practice as well. You know, the terms like lens-based art and performance mm. art and the whole concept of artistic practice has completely changed. And now when you build things into create art on blockchains, or like, I mean, I don't know if people call crypto kitties art, but they're spawned through smart contracts and they're created. Exactly on a DLT. So, you, you know, are you creating art on DLT and some people have and do, or are you supporting your community using distributed ledger technology to underpin your community and the commerce around and participated in by that community and fandom and those kind of things. Okay, Kevin, let's hold it there. Brian, Brian Elders, based down in Skibbereen, his best friend is his car mechanic, I just recently learned. <laughs> I came to Skibreen in time for COVID and I have a book to go to. <laughs> um, tell us, tell us about yourself, your career, and uh, what you think an NFT is. Well, yeah, I'm in Skibreen, as you said. Uh, I came back after 20 years being, you know, working all over the world, first of all in Europe, then in Asia. And uh, I came across uh, Bitcoin in 2011 when I was in Singapore. Uh, many regrets about not, you know, gathering lots of it back then, <laughs> um, but uh, got involved more seriously in a self-sovereign digital identity uh, company in about 2015. And since then have got deeper and deeper into uh, the whole world of digital assets uh, until, you know, in 2017 and 18, basically set up the company that is source digital assets now and, uh, and dive straight in and where we help people, we help people to create, sell and trade all sorts of digital assets. So there's a spectrum, I would say, starting off with, uh, 
you know, unregulated things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. You have on the other side, fully regulated things like you know, debt, securities, equities, and things like that. In the middle, uh, kind of digital goods and digital goods can be NFTs. Uh, they can be lots of different things. And I suppose when I look at NFTs, I look at them a little bit differently than the art world and I can talk about it in a while, but you know, how would I describe NFTs? Uh, let's say you're out in the morning uh, or in, in, you're out just uh, at lunchtime and you go to the shop and you want to pick up some milk. So as long as it's your super value milk and it's low fat, this bottle is as good as this bottle. So you buy whichever milk it is that you want. They're fungible because it doesn't matter if that bottle or that bottle, as long as it's the brand and type that you want, it's okay. And you continue driving and you go down to the school to collect your kids. And it really does matter which one you pick up because this one and this one are different. So, you know, that'd be my way of uh, describing the difference between them. An unfungible token is your child <laughs> and they're unique. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I also look at it, um, you know, uh, the, the other thing I would look at, I'd, I look at these sort of technological innovations and I think they can have lots of unexpected uh, impacts. And the, the little story I always tell is when the iPhone came out, it was, uh, it was an amalgamation of an iPod touch uh, which was the screen-based iPod that they had at the time, and, uh, and a telephone. And uh, if you were to tell your average taxi driver that it would change your life when Uber came along, at that stage, they wouldn't believe you. So, you know, you have these technologies that come out and enable things to happen um, that, you know, uh, it's unclear at the time when they're created, how that impact will manifest itself. And I think NFTs are something very similar. The NFTs, obviously, CryptoKitties and, you know, playing around with uh, the Street Fighter cards and stuff like that, you know, uh, I've, you know, I've done and things like that, but where I see NFTs coming up a lot and where we've seen applications of it would be in, you know, some of the recent projects we've been involved in where they would have been kind of, you know, a, a token raiser, whatever it would be, but on, on the side of it and related to it, you would have uh, NFTs created and those NFTs can be sold for value or they can be given away as part of uh, however the, 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 the project is organizing itself. And those uh, have a value of their own. They can, like a membership right, you know, a golden circle sort of member or, you know, uh, access rights or many, many different things. But I think you will see it then flowing through into financial products and things like this in the future too. Uh, you can already see this in Germany with Centrifuge and others like this. But um, so I, I come at it, I, I, I haven't spent much time with the art part of it yet. I think we will in the future because we have a few projects ongoing in that space. But I look at this and I say, you're creating assets, be it a membership to a club, access rights to whatever. Uh, you're creating all of these different things that have this, you, these, these characteristics that can be yours and you can own and that you can say, I definitely have something. And you're right. One of the things you said actually a minute ago reminds me, if anyone here has ever moved country, uh, will notice that when they move from country A to country B, uh, on, say, their, on their iTunes, uh, the, the movies that they have bought and own <laughs> uh, disappear when they change uh, store. Why? Because you don't actually own them and you haven't actually bought them because uh, the, uh, the IP is only relevant for if you're in Singapore or Hong Kong or Ireland or wherever. So uh, the whole concept of actually owning something is very interesting because on Apple, when you hit buy, you don't actually buy, you, yeah. you borrow it. Yeah. yeah, it's like distribution rights and it's an extension yeah. of those very, very well formed um, markets and industry. Yeah. They didn't and give me a refund. <laughs> they disappeared. It wasn't me, Brian. It wasn't yeah. me. I didn't take your movies. <laughs> um, just before we move on, I think that's a real, I know, you know, maybe you're not quite ready yet, but there's, I know part of what you're involved with, whether it's with Black Manta or, or even Source Digital, looking at custody and is that, are you focusing on crypto asset custody or are you linking that in that physical and digital way to, you can NFT items like? Yeah, we are looking at it and we did set up a custodian in, in Ireland recently. It's a uh, it's alive, but it's not public. Uh -huh. <laughs> it will become public this month. But yeah, NFTs are part of it. You know, when NFTs are just kind of toy things to be uh, played around with and experimented with, that was one thing. When they become significant amounts of value, that's a different thing. And if you look at even financial assets, if you were to even just think of a share, a numbered share, and some companies have numbered share, you have, you know, you get a share certificate and it's one, two, three, four, five. That's different than one, two, three, four share. Yeah, it's different. So you can look at financial assets that have maybe immense value 
and these things can be represented as NFTs, and that those will need uh, proper custody and arrangement. In, so my background is a little bit different. I'm a software engineer. And so the excitement when you're learning uh, software development and software engineering and this concept of uh, encapsulation and making objects, and there's this sort of sense of complete power when you can like define and control the system and name things. And I feel like this whole NFT thing is creating this burgeoning opportunity in business for business to encapsulate ideas and to name them what they want and define what the value is. And I just feel like it's um, it's maybe an, a, you know, an improper uh, um, metaphor but there's that same sense of excitement and empowerment i think in the marketplace and uh, if we capture that excitement or if we reflect on that i think that really captures what's unknown at the moment um, 100%. and yeah it is an exciting time innovation everywhere exactly and i think on that note there paula why don't we move to you paula has recently as i said returned from the the far east or <laughs> and she can tell us a little bit about uh, her experiences there and now she's she's back here she's working she's a lecturer and i'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about that and working uh, with our latest top retail students to bring them the uh, realities from, from emerging markets and, and, and really big e-commerce, de-commerce marketplaces. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Paula. So yeah, I'm a fashion retail innovation lecturer at TU Dublin and also strategic account advisor for Otada AI with Trinity's Tangent, the assessor program. On the program at the moment, we do have um, two retail AI use cases, mostly computer vision. Um, so blockchain was kind of like an obvious uh, transition and also uh, in China, then I'm the co-founder of China Retail Innovation Lab by Shop Greater China. Um, so I basically got into the kind of, well, I, I've known about blockchain pretty much um, in China from 2016. I did a TEDx talk and Divining the Undefined, educating the entire supply chain simultaneously to encourage sustainability. So in this time, you know, I was talking about different kinds of uh, systems that are integrating and passing on value in real time, which would actually, technology would enable us to create more sustainable uh, products and services in the fashion industry. Um, so in terms of NFTs, yeah, big market, big fan of token tokenization. I think it's really going to add a lot of uh, value for brands. I also think, you know, having NFTs and creating these new ecosystems um, will create a great space for artists and fashion people to create new art and this will give them access to new customers and new revenue models. Um, in terms of China, um, because China, I believe, is home of retail attainment and retail gamification, um, it was kind of there. They have a very like digitally mature uh, ecosystem, a unique e ecosystem, and we're the first in social uh, commerce using various technologies. So I think it's only a matter of time, maybe next week, two weeks, uh, where the Chinese may consider private tokenization and NFTs. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. So I'll be delivering, um, I'll be sharing with you some examples of um, how we use NFTs in fashion or where I see the potential and basically the kind of key players that are using them or hoping to use uh, NFTs in the fashion space. Cool. Uh, that's it, so. Do you wanna share, do you wanna oh. share your slides now? Oh, I can, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's get some great ideas. <laughs> okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, can you see my screen? You are screen sharing. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, yep. cool. All right, so I believe that fashion is going to be about co-creation and thankfully to blockchain, AI, IOTs and all the other kind types of technology on this ecosystem are going to give us a new access to new markets and new opportunities. Um, so I just told you a little bit about myself. So actually my background's in luxury fashion, haute couture mostly. So I have had some issues uh, with IP, particularly in, I had one client who wanted an haute couture dress was 400 grand. And uh, then I got a, an email from Carl Lagerfeld to say that they wanted to use her prototype. Um, and this was, she said, well, I want to buy the digital rights and my prototype. And I said, well, technically you don't own it, but well, we own the dress. So that was kind of the first time where I thought about, you know, IP and digital and haute couture, which is customized fashion. Moving on from that. Um, and also you can see my Paris Chanel Fashion Week. I lost my invitation, so I was very sad. So I'm hoping maybe in the future we have some kinds of tokens whereby everything's digital and we're, we're participating in virtual environments and you can buy these haute couture dresses both in the physical and uh, digital retail uh, world. 
Okay, so fashion art and blockchain technology. So yeah, they're all coming together. They will benefit culture because we know in fashion, we have a big issue with the cultural appropriation. So with NFTs and this kind of um, digital fashion platforms, you know, the, the digital fashion will be created in a localized setting. We talked about geo, I think we talked about geopolitics there as well and geo IP. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of um, kind of localized digital fashion and that we this will serve this cultural appropriation issue that we have with fashion whereby, you know, certain kinds of, um, how will I say, fashion created in one space may be um, sensitive to other spaces and so on. In terms of IP ownership and traceability, again, the fashion supply chains using um, blockchain technology uh, to create ownership and traceability. So we know sustainability is a big one and I believe that technology can enable, enable this. Uh, so China retail, so like I said, uh, we're first, they are first uh, in gamification and re retail attainment and are very comfortable in digital mature markets because they already use tokenization vouchers for brand activation and customer attraction. This is because uh, in China, 59% of the population are smartphone users and we know that uh, Tencent, this is a company that I worked for in WeChat Pay over, overseas for two years and it was a natural progression for me in fashion because a lot of my clients wanted to pay with e-payment and they wanted to use uh, Weixin or Jufu Bao as a deposit. So it was natural that I actually ended up working with um, WeChat Pay uh, in luxury brands. So they interface with luxury brands. So at Tencent, we know that 36% of their revenue comes from games and uh, quite another um, majority comes from social media. Also, Douyin, TikTok, Pindou, Douyin, uh, and they're very comfortable using AI as well. And they're using like video commerce, streaming and so on. So the NFT adoption, I think is going to be really, really fast. But like China, China creates its own version of everything. Um, so I definitely think that's coming for sure. Um, the first, I was involved in the first uh, Burberry store, digital store in Shenzhen. Do you guys want to see it? It's just like a couple of seconds, just to show you the digitally mature, how mature China is. Uh, and I was pretty much, there for eight years working on this this kind of technology. Um, so this is an omni-channel retail environment, uh, interface with Weixin and Jufu Bao, so it's got e-payment and WeChat mini programs. So obviously the art will be displayed in store. There's a, very, there's a variety of data points. So the whole ecosystem will be both offline and online. So yeah. So you get the idea anyway. So this type of technology is already, it's, it's present in China. Um, moving on from that then, I, um, one sec now. Did you know that you can make money from YouTube oh, sorry, without guys, sorry, creating videos? That's Hold on right. a second. You can use other people's videos to make money from YouTube. Allow me I to I have explain. a new laptop. You see, these products and app companies will create what's called okay, a sorry guys, hang on a second. video. That is so funny. The most surprising spam I've ever, ever received. <laughs> the only thing that would be better if it was a Rick roll, honestly, that, that's amazing. Um, Paula, let me know when you've, uh, just unmute yourself there when you've stopped spamming us about YouTube videos. <laughs> All right, guys, we're back. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Thank okay, you. Cool. So, guys, there's an example of Tencent, Honor of Kings, and Mac. So, what you have is there you have a game, and inside the game, then you could have tokens, and these tokens then can be um, you can buy like Mac products in the real world. So, you can dress your avatar in the Mac products, or you can save up your tokens to buy Mac lipsticks in the real world. So, guys, that's just an example of how digitally mature um, the China market is for. Um, so, okay, so NFTs and fashion. So we know that um, I believe an NFT is basically a, cre a creative and unique digital media, which comes with an authenticity cer uh, certificate. So this is great for traceability and IP. So when we have two types of fashion, we've got digital, which is basically digital media and physical worlds. And we do this with like AR and VR, mostly try-ons. And then you in the NFT world, then we have these digital native fashion uh, platforms. And one of the platforms that I was looking at was DigitalX, which is owned by Emma Jane McKinnon. I met her on Clubhouse. And basically she's created this new fashion operating system whereby you can make and sell NFTs. And not only that, you can create your own fashion collection. And this is a great kind of platform for developers and artists to express themselves. So here's an example of a digitally native fashion world. Uh, it runs on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so basically guys, you see here in terms of the NFTs, they have like parent NFTs and child NFTs. 
So the child NFTs then are basically things like materials, patterns. So we're sitting down making a collection. We have a variety of different kinds of patterns, textures, and materials. These are child NFTs. Then these form large parent NFTs, which are modular, like a dress, for example, would have a various, would be composed of various um, child NFTs. And these are wrapped then in smart contracts. And there's another actually layer of security, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So what you have is then guys, is you have these like digitally native art that can be tried on in an AR world, in, in, a, in, a, in a totally immersive world. So this is pure digital art, but it follows, you know, the traditional methods of developing a, a fashion collection. So also in terms of selecting the materials for the fashion collection, they have what we call a periodic table, a DOF sheet, and the DOF sheet then each NFT uh, matches with the real world in terms of their price and their scarcity and so on. So you can see there's a whole new ecosystem developing there in terms of creating fashion art. Um, here's an example of an XR environment. I actually turned up at that on Saturday. Um, I didn't have an NFT wardrobe, so I left. Um, so guys, so they're kind of examples of, you know, where the NFT art is going to be used inside these um, virtual um, environments. We can also see Digital Axe as well, actually have an auction that was there about two months ago on selling art. And this then lends itself into the gaming world. And then OpenSea and Rarible. So guys, we've already talked about these. Um, my three favorites, CryptoKitty is a category. Then we have Jeffree Star and Marcelo. Um, basically, Jeffree Star is like a fashion media mogul. And uh, he did a collaboration with Marcelo and they have a, var a variety of um, digital uh, crypto art on OpenSea. Um, and also crypto um, girlfriends. I don't know if you heard about that one. Um, that, that was also um, these like 16 hand pixel drawn um, characters that can be used inside a gaming environment. And then the physical then, the, the stuff that I'm most comfortable with would be the AR and VR. We know Gucci's recently um, did a virtual digital product uh, where you can, and so does Maximo Duty. I have it on my app right now. I can scan my foot and I can see the sneakers on it. So there is an example of kind of like how digital fashion and retail is happening at the moment, but it's not necessarily an NFT, but it's a digital, uh, it's digital media. And just to finish up then guys, probably my most fav my favorite, um, how will I say platform or brand at the moment is called Materialized. It is a video from YouTube. I know to switch it off. So this is the final one. So this, I think these are most innovative in the space. Okay, so Luxo guys is basically a blockchain that is powered by um, the, basically the people from Chanel and LVMH, Knight and so on have created this, this blockchain has been around a long time. So they're the ones that are actually developing these new uh, platforms for NFTs and digital fashion. And that's it. Thanks. Absolutely amazing, Paulette. So you captured the uh, excitement, I think, really, really well. And all of those commercial possibilities, uh, but also... I think you've evoked really that sense of community, loyalty, fandom, desirability, scarcity, that really important thing. I mean, I'm so uh, to like never endingly impressed by how fashion has managed to um, articulate like a spider web, just mm -hmm. the degree scarcity, desirability, and, and has atomized it to the point where <laughs> buy anything. It's just <laughs> glorious. <laughs> it's definitely ready for it. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, listen, thanks a million. Um Kevin, can I go back to you a little bit? What are your thoughts about the that idea of this the scarcity, the community for whom that scarcity matters? Um what what challenges or what excites you about that space or that possibilities um to be honest fiona the, the most exciting part is um we're just at the very start of all this you know like the you know the opportunities are are absolutely endless um you know and even looking at the basic applications of you know uh from a, a certification perspective from a ticketing perspective all the way through to fashion it's 
absolutely fantastic and you know uh, i suppose this is the very start of it like even though nfts have been around in some shape or form you know from you know 2012 and then crypto kitties 2017 now if you look at the mainstream media uh you know the coverage of it alone over the last uh three months has been absolutely phenomenal and uh, I think the next 12 months we're going to see so many different use cases um as well as the ones that are are, are clearly already there yeah amazing um a little shout out to blockchain ireland two years ago in the 2018 blockchain ireland myself and some colleagues decided we were going to uh put dance ip hip-hop uh, sequences onto blockchains and see if we could trace the sequencing and the origins of um, dance sequences. Oh, that's right. Yeah. There's a lot of... I remember uh, talking to me about that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of social sharing. I mean, it's it, in a way, it's an impossible challenge, but the, the uh, dipping into that culture, that fandom, that whole experience of how... Um, to, uh, they probably use TikTok tiktok now but it was an instagram based thing where they'd be recording themselves and sharing moves and stuff before the kind of competitions and uh, they reference each other but in a very careful way because you you know you end up stealing somebody else's moves and it's completely verboten and it's it's really the the peer um knowledge that makes a difference so there's something so exciting about translating some of those things those difficult things into uh into because I'm an engineer, I'm like blockchain systems or software systems and how we can trace that. Um, so Brian, is there anything you, you think about that whole scarcity aspect that is is maybe, is that is the, is the scarcity thing the, the, a, a big commercial stepping stone for companies? I think so. It's like um, in, in so many aspects of life, you know, um, having, having, you know, access to something or being first in the queue for something is important, yeah? um you know when you look at music and things like that if you're a, a certified super fan by having you know certain nf if certain music is an nft and you own 10 of them and you're first in the queue to you know get the new album you know that or to get a ticket to a concert or things like this it's worth it you know with the nreach project one of the nfts that was released there it gave the people who purchased the nft access to the dev team so they could you know interact at a deeper level with the dev team and people value that so people buy them, yeah. So uh, it, it, you know, it's useful. Um, similarly, with the, the Leprechaun uh, project, there was NFTs there that granted, uh, you know, access priorities and you know things like this in the project. And again, they were valued, and there was an auction that was well taken up. So I think that across humanity, <laughs> fashion and elsewhere, scarcity is important. Yeah. Mm. Particularly with luxury brands, like you have uh, Birkin bags, and you know, do collaborations with artists and the Chinese are quite wealthy and they, they want both they want the digital and i've already had requests from clients saying when is the nft available when's the nft yeah. I don't have it yet yeah 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 which is is absolutely fantastic because you know six months nine months ago would that same question have actually been there you know did they want the nft yeah. i think we're going to see all sorts of stuff coming along like why not have a, an NFT for your golf membership and things like this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's endless. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it'll be in the normal, the normal day-to-day -day activities that you go about mm -hmm. that you'll see them creeping in over, over a period of time. And, you know, the, the example that Paul was giving of the parent and child piece, you know, you also see that even with the, you know, as I say, the street fighter cards and other things like this, the idea of having, a collection of nfts together behaving in a particular way uh, is also something that is you know we're only touching the top of the iceberg here as we explore how those things can work together yeah it's yeah that's true because actually um it's funny because brian i'm not sure if you remember uh this time last year uh in the cash hub we had a talk on specifically uh, it was on nfts and we were just covering the very basics on it and mm -hmm one of the main points that came out of it was um, once we started to see mainstream media get involved and started to see use cases and 12 months on um, what Paula has has obviously shown us there is absolutely incredible yeah we had we had an event two years ago in Cork for Black blockchain week that had one of the original movers and shakers in uh, in uh, NFTs in Cork yeah. and a very famous band 
turned up. <laughs> uh, That's right. <laughs> we're investing. Yeah, you were there actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to tell us who the band was. You can't leave us hanging. <laughs> I'm wondering. Have a guess. <laughs> Support band. <laughs> um, okay, I am seeing uh, we have a great number of um, people on the call today. Does anybody have any questions? You can feel free to type them in the chat if anyone's got any comments to add or any queries. Um, I think myself, Paula, Kevin and Brian could talk forever about the excitement of the space and what's happening. But um, yeah feel free to, to raise a hand or, or type a question. And to suggest new events and to participate well, in them, yeah? Yeah, because uh, we would read, we, we do, we have from, obviously from within the, the Blockchain Ireland Startups Group, we've got a, a, a few nominated uh, additional speakers, but if there's anybody that our, our, our participants here on the call would like to hear from, we could certainly try and bring them into this idea of the working lunch. Um, maybe something like stepping through the process of how we would create an NFT and how we would define the value which is being underpinned, whether it's a digital asset or whether it is um, uh, or, or a real world asset. Okay, um, Pasindu is asking, Paula, this one's for you, how are current IPs managed in fashion? Good question. I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, in terms of like when somebody buys like an haute couture dress or I'm in the haute couture business. So it's like they make maybe three dresses in each collection. Um, so they don't own the IP rights of the dress. So I'm not familiar with. So, so the purchaser doesn't own the IP, the designer does. And it's covered, exactly. as far as I understand it, it's covered yeah. under fairly standard design rights. Exactly. Um, yeah. And many... And, and, and it's covered by trademarking through brands and... On the brand side, yeah. And like I said, I ran into that issue when Miss Jong asked me for the IP rights of her dress. And she wouldn't have asked me only for, I got a text message saying, can we use Miss Jong's prototype on a celebrity? Uh, and she said no. And then eventually she said yes. But she said in the future, I want to own my dress, my prototype. And I want the digital rights to it. Fine. So that came through about three weeks ago. So that is negotiating. Um, so if you think of like the film industry and the digital rights or digital distribution rights, and you can renegotiate them or have different uh, mm -hmm. distribution rights in different territories, as, as Brian was talking about. So um, that uh, Pasindu, as I understand it, there's very little that's novel in the in the management of uh, design IP in the fashion industry. In fact, that is one of the industries that was probably boxed off fairly early, along with music industry and um, IP rights there, and, and which are often contested, as we know. <laughs> um, uh, but that's a kind of a different discussion. There's another question here from Alan Kavna, who we all know is actually over in Rwanda at the moment. Um, so he is asking a question um, for the parent and child fashion project. Is there a company that then make a physical item of the digital asset? And do you see this becoming a trend in the bespoke physical fashion world? Again, that's for Paula. So your question is, is the, well, we haven't cost, we, we see it already when you log on to the internet and you come to a platform and then you can customize your Nike runners or and then the Nike runner arrives with your name on it. So it does exist, but it's in it's it's not an NFT. It's it's a digital uh, media um, that's linked to a physical product, but it is not an NFT. You don't own the rights to it. But customization of Nike kicks is an example of this. And then your second question: Do you think this is becoming a trend in bespoke physical fashion? To be honest, uh, absolutely, Alan. In fact, I'm I'm exploring it right now as we speak. Um, bespoke. Uh, au couture mostly. So I'm talking to the luxury brands about this, uh, creating this, this digital um, IP and then owning the rights to the physical and digital um, product. So 100%, no doubt. Really, really interesting. Uh, is anybody else got any questions there or any comments they would like to add? Pasindu again, are those NFTs legally binding and is it accepted in the court? Brian. I would say that uh, this is probably untested in Ireland, but other digital assets, you know, if the Criminal Assets Bureau wants to take them from you, they can. So they're definitely recognized as assets and they're definitely recognized as having a legal stature. So uh, 
I think that it has never been tested in Ireland, but for sure, if you own it, there is a, there is rights that you possess. And you can be taxed on it. You can be taxed on these things, yeah. So if they're taxing it and can seize it from you, it definitely uh, it definitely is some sort of legally binding. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of very we could spend ages talking about this. You know, is there VAT on them? <laughs> you know, there's lots of uh, untested, un un kind of unworked out pieces about what exactly NFTs are because if an NFT is a financial product, no, 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 uh, there's definitely no VAT. But if it's a if it's a good, well, maybe there is. So. Uh, I think that not only is it, uh, they're definitely legally binding, but how and the, the, the precise detail, um, you know, I think that uh, we it's emerging. Can we say yeah. that? It's yeah, emerging. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I suppose, like, as we've seen over the last number of years, you know, how various jurisdictions have, have actually come out and commented on the treatment of digital assets, we'll start to see that happening. Um, you know, but again, when we just don't know. Really interesting. Um, uh, Paula, there's another one here for you. Are there any high street brands using blockchain technology to prove their compliance with anti-slavery requirements? Very interesting question. Well, we know H&M use blockchain and AI in their supply chains or certain kinds of parts of their supply chain. So in terms of CSO or, or you know, promoting this kind of like activism, um, how will I say there is not anti-slavery particularly if you're talking about like sweatshops and you know initiatives to ensure that they're, they're choosing they're paying their staff and we saw in COVID a lot of the supply chains were broken um one of our brands actually in, in Ireland uh, didn't pay the workers in the factory um and then we were saying well you know if your if your supply chains were connected in real time we'd be able to forecast COVID or we'd be able to forecast you know, a reduction in the in the in the fashion industry in terms of the consumer, and we could stop the supply chain on time. So I don't have an example of slavery rights as such, but there are um, they do use blockchain and AI, and there are kind of what we call like these CSR initiatives um, that sit on the supply chain uh, that brands are looking at because we notice now brand activism is a big thing in fashion as well. I mean, we've seen through COVID whereby Nike used. Um, and Nike and Michelle Obama did an IGTV on voting advocacy yeah. um, as, as a CR campaign. So yes, I definitely think these kind of uh, initiatives and CSR activities will become more transparent and, and, and the, the consumer will be able to see inside the blockchains and see you know, if the brand is behaving in a sustainable way in terms of human rights and utilizing their resources. I, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, um, to be honest, I don't think the fashion industry is really going to be necessarily the first mover there. There's longstanding and well-known issues, I think, around um, factory conditions, in, in particularly in fast fashion, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But we do see in other industries, if we think, um, Kevin, I'm thinking about AgriLedger, for example, which in the mm. industry is underpinning um, fair trade initiatives and fair payment of um, agricultural workers in distant lands, let's say, for the export markets and underpinning, um, well, it's not even necessarily exports, but uh, Kevin, you maybe you want to- Yeah, yeah, that. because um, I suppose from the AgriLedger perspective, that's, that's one of the companies that um, we've been working with over the last couple of years. Um, they've had a very successful pilot over, over in Haiti and, um, you know, that's essentially track and trace from all the way from the farmer all the way through. And generally, um, the uh, the operation uh, that I'm, I'm talking about in uh, in relation to AgriLedger was a was a World Bank project, which was was focused on it was actually mango and the it was both export and it was selling the um, selling the mango internally within Haiti as well, um, but ensuring that the actual payment element was done properly as well, so that the farmer was getting the right apportionment of, of money and it wasn't being sucked up by any external agencies. So um, in fairness to John VF, she's done a, done a fantastic job with that project. And I think uh, the farmer's returns were 5X um, from the actual, actual time before, before AgriLedger was involved. It's really interesting because they're, and I think with, you know, the Moy Coffee Project as well, mm. it's bringing a focus. So like the, the payment and the value is generated earlier in the supply chain and that can be tracked. 
Um, yeah, and then you've got the whole trust element as well, yeah. and that's obviously the key. Uh, with the add-on benefit of, of of facilitating payments through the system, hmm. yes. the simplicity <laughs> of that, you know, it's it's really really interesting. Seamless so, integration, yeah. So um, this uh, to a different topic now, Brian. You mentioned you mm -hmm. mentioned centrifuge, and in Germany, uh, it's at, at the forefront of blockchain and NFTs and financial services. What is centrifuge doing, and how might financial services in general be transformed by these new developments? I think we could have a week of things on DeFi, and I'd be very happy to help catalyze some of that. But what centrifuge is doing is trying to, and there's a few of these around, trying to bridge that gap between traditional finance and DeFi. And they have a couple of things like uh, Paper Chain, which is used to finance Spotify receivables. They have another one called Centrifuge, which is trade receivables. At the moment, these are all small in value, uh, more experimental sizes, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of euros or dollars involved. But it is, you know, putting in place those uh, bridges between uh, these ways of financing how, how life works. So if we change how we finance how life works, that's a fairly fundamental change. And, uh, you know, we're at that early innovative stage. There's a whole heap of things going on and we could, I'm very happy to do more events on DeFi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, shout out, uh, Brian and Source Digital are running a number of different events during, four events, I think, during uh, Blockchain Ireland Week, which is going to be the, the third week in May, 24th to the 28th. And uh, more details will be revealed in due course. But um, there will be plenty of information and um, uh, probably, you know, it's all going to be online kind of stuff. So hopefully Paula can dress us all. We can all like purchase yeah, gowns to wear to the Source <laughs> Digital <laughs> events during the Ireland down. Week. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, listen, just on that last point, Sunny Kumar asks, uh, do you see hmm. NFTs? Uh, finding a place in crowdfunding, 100%. And is we already had three examples. That, you yeah. know, if you look at the three projects I spoke about, they all had some part of it was NFTs. Yeah. And they all raised money with the NFTs. They were not the center of it, but they were definitely... Mm -hmm. In Same with fashion, that the Mint Fund, uh, Mint Fund is the actual uh, crowdsourcing for uh, artists and fashion people. Yeah. Very interesting. So there's talk. Uh, thanks, Sunny. So he was saying that there's talk of NFTs replacing ICOs. I wouldn't say that they have different functions, but you know, yeah, different functions. But and yeah. it's a mix and match, as you said. Yeah. When you're using or have used NFTs to underpin kind of VIP type again that sort of desirability, desirability and scarcity aspect, underpinning uh, side by side funding projects that might have an ICO element or something else. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're. They're, they are. You can use it in the securities industry as well. Like, there's nothing stopping you, you know, being authorized to buy. I don't know if you're a professional investor, you can buy more than a hundred thousand, and that can be on the system. It can recognize an NFT that ha encodes that information about your identity. So there's, it's um, yeah. Sorry, we could talk a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have eight minutes left before 2 p.m. And that would, that's a very, very productive working lunch. Um, would anybody else like to add, anybody want to add a question in the comment? Uh, and anybody on the panel have anything else they'd like to add? Well, I will add, I am supremely grateful that uh, each of you were able to uh, pick up the mantle uh, this is something that came out of, it, it was multiple chats across a ridiculous amount of channels after our last startups group meeting. And all of a sudden, within like 20 minutes, we had a first panel and a first topic. And I'm, I'm forever grateful to the three of you for just uh, pitching in and sharing the benefits of your expertise. It's been it's been really uh, instructive. And I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe continuing whatever comes out of this NFT discussion. Um, and yeah, thanks a million. Watch, watch our, <laughs> our social to find out when the next events will be. And I would say if you're not using Clubhouse, uh, I think it's an absolute amazing um, resource for learning about new technologies and you get to talk to the CEOs and the developers directly. So it's a really, really great platform for learning about new technology. Like a 24 seven. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm not. The yeah. CEO. <laughs> I, I eat yeah, sleep yeah, it. <laughs> That's what we need in COVID times. Oh my God, a place to go and hang out when we have uh, COVID insomnia. <laughs> 
Um, there's one last question. Seamus O'Shea is asking about suggestions for courses to learn more about this topic. I can say for sure there are multiple certification courses running, whether DCU, National College of Ireland, upskilling boot camps, um, emerging technologies. Some, some are focused on blockchain, some are uh, across the board, AI, intro kind of things. So if you're a business person and you want to upskill and move more into the digital side of business, well, then there's a there's a number of different courses and I know uh, Dave Feenan who's the chairperson of Blockchain Ireland yeah. he is with Skillsnet and if you are in that horrible transition between jobs furloughs COVID payments blah 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 there is a, a new set of courses available through Skins, Skillsnet which are for people who are currently unemployed so if you're kicking around looking for stuff to do there are courses available there I would definitely recommend looking at the Skillsnet website I'm sure other organizations like Springboard um, also have similar type um programs and yeah ears to the ground i can also say that the blockchain ireland has a skills innovation and education focus group and they are doing um a, a survey at the moment um about um skills shortages shortages and skills um requirements mm -hmm. Uh, and there will be, I'm sure that they will be publishing and making available um, their sort of recommended list of, of places to go and um, upskill. I have a final thought. What are you, well, Alan's going to hear me saying this, but what is more exciting, blockchain or AI? Blockchain. Blockchain, of course. Uh, I was going to say. <laughs> blockchain, my gosh, I'm so excited about blockchain. Yeah. Blockchain is a foundational, uh, it, it's foundational. It's a bit like the internet. <laughs> Do an awful lot of stuff in itself, but what it can do yeah. is facilitate new businesses, new business models, and bring you global reach. AI can yeah. help you do something clever, maybe smarter, uh, and maybe on a mass scale, like natural language processing, but that's not fully resolved yet about how uh, um, uh, efficient that is. Yeah. The other thing I'd say about learning, thing. Hmm? the other thing I'd say about learning is, Innovation sort of happening in front of us right now. Um, you know, the mint art thing that Paula mentioned, that that funds, you know, that that's a little fun to get things off the ground. You know, you can play around with that. Or if you have a 20, 30, 40, 50 euros that you want to spend on some NFT that's coming out next week, just join the party. You know, just experiment. You know, see see what's happening. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's no better way than, you know, actually jumping in and, and actually getting involved. And obviously, mm -hmm. if you're looking for NFT, uh, information in particular, uh, there's a lot of sources from, you know, from the likes of Coin Telegraph and the One Blockchain. Uh, stick with the reputable sources, though. Yeah, and don't follow those ads on Twitter where they say they're going to give you free ether. Yeah, <laughs> That's it awesome. doesn't exist. <laughs> That's a scam. <laughs> Anything else? Do your due uh, diligence. Don't spend money that you can't afford to lose and uh, enjoy yourself because it's a highly creative, highly cultural space. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, and everybody else, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, uh, we, we will uh, make the recording available to anybody who missed it. And um, we possibly, hopefully, will be having another one next week, but we will put it on social. That's how we, and we can even email you uh, as attendees uh, with the details of the next event. So thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.